markets, speculation, and risk. This is the Chat with Traders podcast, hosted by Aaron Fifield. Hi, traders, and welcome to episode 199. This here is another compilation episode. So just like the best of risk management episodes from a few months back, except this time, I've compiled some of the best clips on trading psychology. Again, I dug up way too much from the back catalog of almost 200 episodes to pack into one episode. So this is only part one, a part two will follow shortly. Besides creating a go-to trading psychology resource, I hope this might also highlight some past episodes that you've not yet heard. So before each clip, you'll hear I mention the episode number in case you want to go back and listen to the full interview. Plus, all episodes can be easily located in the show notes at chatwithtraders.com slash 199. Now, to get things started, this first clip is a gem from the very early days of Chat With Traders. It's taken from episode eight, and it's Options Madman and Nand Sangvi, aka Lucci. Lucci has been on the podcast a couple times, and given some of the large p swings he experiences, it's always a treat to hear him talking psychology. What are some of your best tips to uh, sort of keep a handle on your emotions? Um, do you have any sort of advice on the subject that you wish someone shared with you when you're starting out? Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like you go through so many different emotional stages of your life, you know? So, so you got to remember like whatever, whatever environment that you have around you, that's what's going to influence your decisions. And that's what's going to influence your emotions. So for example, when I was 23, 24, you know, I just had a, I just had a baby. Uh, you know, my thing was all about, you know, how do I, how do I make sure I got rent and all that kind of stuff covered every single day? You know, so, so when I went about trading, it was all about, okay, how do I make 4,000 a month? How do I make 4,000 a month? How do I make, you know, how do I make this, this kind of money a month? And I wasn't looking at the big picture. I was never looking at the big picture. Um, simply because like what my environment decided and, you know, decided how I was going to live, how I was going to make decisions. Um, you know, so whatever you're going through at the time, you always have to be bigger than that. You know, you always have to take a step outside and look at what you're going through and realize that in trading, none of that shit matters. None of it matters. And it's so difficult to do this. It's so difficult to do this, to step away from having to make money, to step away from, um, you know, living, living a certain lifestyle or requiring a certain lifestyle. It's so difficult to step away from all this stuff. Um, and I would say the one most important thing that I wish somebody told me was that to not think about the money when I'm trading, you know? And, and again, you know, this is not something that you learn overnight, but it's something that if you have it in the back of your head, when you're starting, you know, you're closer to the bigger picture than I was, you know? So it took me years to figure that out, you know? And it was all always about to your, your, your lifestyle, like trading can consume you and does consume a lot of people to the point where they don't leave their houses. You know, they don't go out. They don't, they don't talk to people. You know, they, they become very secluded and lonely and loners, you know, simply because like they're, they're slaves to their P&L every single freaking day, you know, and that's all it's about. And that's not what it's about, you know. So living a healthy lifestyle and, and you know, enjoying time with friends, whether you're down on your account or down on the year or you're up or whatever, you know, having a life is so important to being on an even keel, uh, you know, when you're sitting there in front of the in front of the computer, in front of the trading screen, you know. So always thinking about that big picture. Uh, which again, most people stop thinking about it the second they have problems trading or the second they have problems in their environment that they have to deal with. And then subsequently those problems affect their trading decisions. And that's all it is. You know, most of the, most of the bad decisions that you make are a direct result of, of your environment or you, you projecting the problems that you're having in your environment or in your life onto the market. Onto a market which doesn't give a shit about it. We're just, just talking pure probabilities. Market doesn't care if you got issues. You know, it doesn't give a damn. But you're going to project that onto the market 
simply because that's what's going on in your life. That's what you're thinking about. You know, you're thinking about rent. You're thinking about this. You're thinking about, you know, how shitty your life is maybe at that time or how great your life is at that time. You know, you're thinking about all those things and you're projecting this onto a probability mechanism, a market which doesn't give a shit. You know, so that's that's a, that's the biggest thing I can say. You know, keep thinking about the big picture. Don't don't fall into the day to day, you know, hustle and bustle of the market all the time. Realize that the market's not going anywhere. There's going to be money to make tomorrow, the next day, the next day, the day after that. You know, so so don't don't get too wrapped up in every tick uh, of 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 the markets. You know, still tying in with that emotions and psychology sort of thing. How do you keep the confidence up to push on and pull the trigger? Um, after a run of losing trades, <sighs> this one's tough. This one's tough, man. It's tough. It's like it's like <laughs> it's like taking a bad beat. It's always like taking a bad beat. It it it, it takes time. Everything is about time. You know, so let's say you get you get a, you get a run of bad cars, or you get a couple shitty months where you take a bunch of losses. Uh, you know, it just takes time. It takes time for you to step back and realize what happened, and then it takes time for you to stop being uh, depressed. Like humans have this 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 uh, innate sort of ability to 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 what is what is the word I'm thinking of self doubt or to beat themselves up you know after something bad happens like humans always go through a period of time where they beat themselves up about it they're like dude I shouldn't have done this I shouldn't have done this I shouldn't have done this right they kick themselves in their ass too hard and it takes a while to 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 work out of that process and to start feeling more confident about yourself to start feeling you know like you actually can do this you know what I mean I mean you know during a period of bad losers you know, there's nothing in the world that feels <laughs> feels as bad. I mean, again, obviously there's worse situations everywhere, but it, you know, it's a horrible feeling in the pit of your stomach. You're just like, dude, can I even do this anymore? Um, and it takes time. It always takes time to come back out of that scenario. And that's again why it's so important to stay on that even keel, to to continue to live your life and enjoy your life, and to continue to have other things around you that you're motivated by as well. It can't just be about the markets all the time, you know. So that will help those, uh, you know, those periods of self doubt and you know you're beating yourself up, depression and all that kind of stuff. You know that will help making those periods a lot smaller, so you can uh, you know automatically bounce back and jump back into the game. You know, for me, it's like. It's like two months or three months where I sort of like size down. I'm like quiet, uh, you know, and then finally, once I get once I get a couple of winners, I mean, you know, I'm ready to get back in there. Next up, Jared Tendler from episode 86. Jared is a mental game coach who works with world champion poker players, professional golfers and pool players and traders too, with the aim to reduce negative and excessive emotion from decision making. And I understand that one issue that affects uh, traders or poker players of all levels is, is something you refer to as tilt. Would you mind sort of describing uh, what is tilt and how to recognize when you're actually, as you call it, on tilt? <laughs> sure. So, so tilt, um, there's, a, there's kind of a couple definitions for it. One was the definition that that was there before I came into poker, which was uh, tilt was pretty much any reason for you to play suboptimally, right? So you're, you're making decisions that are less than what we, you'd, you would consider to be your best. Um, and so upon studying, you know, poker players and their descriptions of tilt, you know, for several years, I really realized that, you know, 80 plus percent of their descriptions tended to be about them getting angry and making bad decisions. And so for me, Tilt is just another word for saying anger. For a lot of poker players, they'll say, you know, tilt is anything, as I said, less than playing your best. But, but what if you're drunk? You know, what if you're tired? Uh, what if you're fearful? Uh, you know, all of those reasons are going to be, are, are going to need unique solutions to them. So, uh, you know, anger is, is really the biggest one. Uh, in trading, um, I would call the equivalent uh, greed and fear. Uh, and maybe to a lesser degree, uh, uh, you know, loss of, uh, of discipline, uh, they tend to be the place, the, the words that traders use most often, uh, to describe their mental game issues when I don't think that that they're actually experiencing greed nor fear or, or, or a lack of discipline, um, that it's something more than that. But within poker, 
what I did was break down uh, seven different types of, of tilt or seven different types of anger uh, that would exist. One was running bad tilt, uh, which meant, you know, players were losing for several days in a row, sometimes weeks or months. And, and they were, you know, just getting crazed as a result of it. Uh, and, and the, the solution to running bad tilt um, has to do with the understanding that emotion accumulates over time. Okay, the brain has a mechanism by which it can, in, in essence, digest emotion. Right, so you have a stressful day, you got angry one day, uh, and so you know you go to bed not in the greatest of moods, but you wake up the next morning, you feel fine. Right, nothing bothering you. You feel it's like a like a normal day. Well, where where did the emotion go? Right, in essence, the brain has like a stomach that digests the emotion, much like it would. Uh, the actual stomach digests food. Uh, but what happens is when there's like a really emotional day, you know, or th- then, you know, you might go to bed and your sleep might even be disrupted uh, in part because your brain is digesting all that. And then when you wake up the next morning, you know, you don't feel quite right. It's almost like an emotional hangover, so to speak. And so when you start that trading day or the poker player, you know, goes down and sits to play poker again, you know, they're not starting with like a, like an empty cup in a sense, right? Their, their tilt threshold, their threshold by which the anger is going to affect their decision-making has, has been lowered, right? Or their emotional level has already risen, however you want to think about it. And so in essence, it's going to take less tilt inducing stuff to get them pissed off to the point where they're going to make bad decisions. So, so dealing with that accumulated emotion becomes really, really important. And so for traders who have this particular issue, one of the best ways that you can uh, start to uh, break apart that accumulated emotion is to do some journaling, uh, is to write. And, and the writing, the purpose of it, first and foremost, is to get out of your head what those emotions are, right? You go have a couple beers at the end of the day, right? You're going to feel better, right? But are you going to actually get rid of the emotion? Probably not, right? So venting to other people, you know, has a way of getting the emotion out, but it's also not as productive. So keeping things inside is, is not a great thing. When you vent on paper, what you, what you do is you give yourself a record of the emotional reactions that are occurring. And that becomes helpful when you go back and look at it a day or two later and you see like, what the hell is going on here? Why am I getting so pissed off? And that's an important question to ask, regardless of the mental game issue that you're dealing with. In particular, we're talking about tilt. Why is it that I'm getting so pissed off here? Is it because I just can't deal with losing this many days in a row? And, and so then you're able to start to solve things. But at a minimum, you know, you can start to deal with running bad by, by just getting that emotion out and minimize the accumulation day by day so that you can give yourself a chance to kind of reset. Uh, the next type of tilt I, I talk about is called hate losing tilt. I should have actually called it competitive tilt in retrospect because, you know, like traders, poker players, you got, you're going to lose a lot, right? And, and, and for people who are competitive, uh, especially those who are athletes or were in any kind of forms of competition earlier in their life, they, they have more control in those other avenues. They've been more successful. And, and so they have more control over winning and losing. So not only do they hate losing, but now they've entered a, a profession where losing is built into the fabric of it and it just pisses them off. There's no way around it, right? There, there's a lot of competition. Well, what you have to do there is have to really start to understand exactly what it is that you're competing for. You know, and, and that's how you can start to correct it and, and reframe the nature of the competition, right? And, and so, you know, you can look at, at your goals as being something that you're competing for, uh, sometimes confidence or good feelings, emotions, you know, you're competing for. Uh, and when you start to understand exactly what, what the nature of the competition is, you can start to round out some of the edges that will, will, will create those problems. Um, injustice tilt, entitlement tilt are two ones that I've mentioned already today. Uh, mistake tilt, uh, revenge tilt. Kind of always a fun one, uh, you know. In in poker, that would be uh, a particular player is is just constantly beating you, uh, or they say something or do something that kind of just annoys you, and then they and then they beat you, uh, or a particular player who has just gotten the best of you, you know, time after time after time, and they, you know, n- now just hearing their that person's name gets you pissed off. Uh, you know, as as I mentioned, right, trading is is a little bit less personalized than poker is, uh, but. Revenge trading definitely exists, <laughs> you know, and in a way of trying to get the market back for screwing you, right? So maybe less about a, p- a person uh, and more about getting the entire market back. Uh, and then the last one is called desperation tilt, uh, and this is where uh, I would say there's there's a line drawn between a performance issue, 
right? Versus an actual gambling problem. And this is an, a very important distinction to make for some traders and poker players to make, right? A, a performance issue means that, that what you're doing, uh, and let, let, actually let me describe first. So desperation to tilt basically means that when, when you are so desperate to recapture your lost uh, your losses that you'll pretty much do anything, right? You're going to increase your bet sizing. You're going to en- enter trades that you have no, you're going to start placing bets in, in industries or in, uh, in names that you don't even know anything about, right? It's, it becomes more pure gambling in a sense. Uh, that desperation to win overrides all logic and you do a lot of stupid shit that you're regretful of, uh, you know, the next day or even later in that day. Uh, when it's a performance issue, you can handle those losses. You can handle all the dumb stuff you've done. When it's a gambling issue, now you're betting with life savings. Now you're betting with, with money that you borrowed from friends. Now, you're, now you're, your life is becoming impaired. Uh, and that's where you've got to really look in the mirror and say, you know, do I actually have skill in this game or am I just a degenerate gambler? And, and fortunately, most of my, my clients uh, have been in the, in the former category where it's a performance issue and we are able to correct it. But if somebody has you know, a, a gambling problem, uh, like I mentioned, I, I refer them to somebody locally because it's not something that I, I work on. Now, I'd like to share with you what I think is a pretty fascinating segment from Michael Samuels on episode 165. Michael's an equities guy with a prop trading background who now predominantly trades news flow around mergers and acquisitions and other major events. Can you tell us a little bit about this situation uh, with Qualcomm? And I can't remember who the other company you mentioned was. Um, you know, you said this deal's kind of falling apart at the moment. I mean, how are you how are you trading around that? You know, one of the mistakes that I've made is the, uh, I'll, I'll call it, the cost of time being sunk in or time sunk cost. The more time that I put into something and the more money I invest in it, the more research I do with it, the harder it is for me to change my mind on it, if that makes any sense. So the short story in this, again, this is 19 months that I'm going to try to sum up in two minutes. The short story is Qualcomm tried to buy this company NXPI. They needed nine different com- uh, they needed nine different countries to approve this deal. Eight of the nine countries uh, agreed, and one country did not, and that was China. And what ended up happening was they got it got very wound up and wrapped up in all sorts of different international conflicts that are currently happening between the United States and China and Trump and you know the prime uh, the, you know and Chairman Xi and. I have found myself, uh, at points, you know, head spinning over this thing. And I've gone to drastic measures to try and gain an edge in this. And the only result has been that it just made me crazy. And, you know, if you want to, I can tell you about some of these drastic measures. Uh, sure. Yeah. (laughs) So, you know, and again, you have to stay within the, the confines of legality, right? You know, so the, you know, there was a point in this story, um, where the Wall Street Journal broke a story that said that Qualcomm executives were waiting for the 10-4 from China to fly over there and finalize the deal. So in my mind at that point, uh, the signal that I wanted to see was the Qualcomm plane taking off from San Diego, California and going to China. And now there's various services that track these sort of private planes. Uh, but in this case, that wasn't possible. And the reason that wasn't possible was because Qualcomm themselves blocks the tail number on their plane. So the next thing that the only other option you have then at this point is, and again, this was a story that I had made up in my head, uh, was that the only way to track this plane is to physically be out there in San Diego and watch it take off. And so I literally just posted a, uh, we have something called TaskRabbit. I don't know if you guys have that there, but. We've got something similar, yeah. Okay, so I posted something on TaskRabbit and the TaskRabbit post read something like, um, go to this airport and watch this plane take off and send me a video of it. And, and I got a response in about 15 seconds. And this woman who was, uh, you know, just a mother of three, she would drop her kids off at school and she would go to the airport 
And she sat there at the airport for me day after day after day after day. And she was probably there for like a week. And I had to deal with her. And the deal was this. I'm going to pay you X, you know, this much a day. And if you get a video of this plane taking off, I'll give you this bonus money, this big bonus money. And she calls me a week later and she says, it's happening. And, you know, you're probably wondering, well, how did I know where the plane was going? Right. That's the big question. They have this plane. How would I know? And the thing is, you don't. But the way that and again, I was making a lot of this up, perhaps um, Qualcomm has two planes. Uh, one is for short distances and one is for long distances. And uh, so I was tracking the big one and the big one took off and she sent me a video of this. And of course, she sent me the video of this at like 345 on a Friday where I have 15 minutes to make up my mind of what I want to do with this situation. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it, that's the kind of stuff that can make you crazy. And cause you think you have this piece of information that no one has, you think, well, what if it happens this weekend and I don't take advantage of it? Uh, so I had better do that now. And not only that, but I was so mentally wrapped up in this thing. I was so like emotionally committed to it. Like it was a person, this trade that I, that I wasn't thinking rationally. And of course I ended up putting on a large position. The deal is still not happening. And, uh, you know, it's, it's probably taken a few years off my life just watching this situation unfold. Right, man, that's a crazy story. <laughs> have you, uh, have you done things like that in the past? Like other situations um, where you've kind of done some, I don't know, stake out excessive, or, excessive due diligence. Yeah. Yeah. Let's call it that. Nothing to that extreme. Okay. You know, nothing to that extreme. I mean, a lot of this job, in my opinion, is, you know, you could call it getting lucky, but you have to be on these conference calls. You have to like be in the game. Like, don't be lazy. You know, one of the, one of the best trades I ever had, I was just, I happened to be a bit lucky, but I happened to be on this, uh, Lumber Liquidators, which is sort of like a, a lumber supply company, uh, conference call in, in, you know, 2014 or 2015. And they happened to mention in the call for, you know, at complete random that they were going to be, uh, on the show called 60 Minutes, which is an investigative journalism show that Sunday. And, and it was like, you know, a grenade went off in the middle of this call. And one of the analysts, you know, it was an earnings conference call. Suddenly no one cares about the earnings. And, and they said, well, what's, you know, what, what's the deal? Why, why are you going to be on 60 minutes? And he said, well, you know, I can't really describe, you know, the contents of it, but I will say this. I, I, I stand by the safety of our wood, you know, which implies, oh shit. Well, the whole segment's going to be that the wood's not safe. And you probably had five to six minutes before this hit, you know, the Bloomberg wires and all the major news wires. And, you know, in trading, that's an eternity. Five or six minutes is an eternity. And, you know, it's, I did great in it, but you look back and you say, well, man, like I could have done this or I could have done that. But I guess what I'm trying to say is one of the things to always remember is just don't sit on your hands, like get in there, like be on every call that you can get on, like just, just be there. So when you got that information, how did you actually build a trade around that? Did you just instantly go short the stock or was there something more to it? In that situation, and again, I've replayed this in my head, oh, oh, I should have done this or I should have done that. I mean, at that point, the stock was trading for 69. You could have shorted it all you wanted down to, let's say, there was unlimited, you know, there was unlimited amount of liquidity in this name till, you know, 65. And at that point, I think it was still like uh, maybe down small on the day. And just so you know, on Monday after that segment, the stock opened at 30. So, wow. you know, you, there's lots of things I could have done. You know, I could have bought puts that were going to expire the following Friday and, you know, before the ball and the puts had exploded. There was lots of things I could have done. What I did was just sort the stock outright because in the moment, you know, when it's happening, you just think, what's the easiest way for me to get exposure? This following clip was recorded at a live event which aired on episode 163 with the legend John Moulton best known as Rambo. 
a nickname and reputation he earned while throwing around huge volume as a spread trader in the pits of the Sydney Futures Exchange. Let's go back to the point you made where you spoke about how it's important to lose. It sounds like you've got a few things you want to say about that. So um, let, let's hear it. <coughs> well, it's just my observation the last couple of years of my life that um, a society in general doesn't really teach people how to lose. They teach you how to win. Winning's easy. Everybody knows how to win. You know, they see LeBron James win a basketball game, making the last shot. He knows how to win. He's a winner. Winning's easy. But is there anything in society that teaches you how to lose? Is there a course at university you take that says, hey, come take this course. We're going to teach you how to lose. Engineering. <laughs> there, is one, there is one thing that will teach you how to lose, and that's organized sport. Because in organized sport, you will lose. Okay? That's the only thing I can think of that teaches you how to lose. Other than that, you have to figure it out for yourself. You really do. And losing is, ex and how you deal with losing is extremely important in trading. Because winning, I'm telling you, is easy. That's easy. It takes care of itself. The key to trading is learning and figuring out how to take a loss and how you deal with that up here. Do you hang on to it and let it bother you? Or do you release it and let it go? All I can say is, is that you need to learn from, the tr when you're trading, you have to learn. And you can learn from, the, from being correct and say, I did that correct. And you learn from that. And you can also learn from when you lose. And when you lose, you have to experience the loss, feel it, learn from it, and spit it out and let it go. And focus on the next trade. If you hang on to a loss too long, it will pollute you. It will not allow you to make the next trade. And you have to focus always on the next trade. The next trade is the most important trade in the world. Not the last trade, or the trade before that, or the trade before that. Just let the trades happen and focus on the now of trading. Do you have the belief that each trade is individual of itself? Like there might be times where you're actually going through a rough period. Um, do you still treat Every Why are you so negative? <laughs> I'm not, but we're Rough talking period. about losing here. It's, um, yeah, yeah no, no, that's true. I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, the way I've always traded, I don't want to use the word high frequency because you guys have algorithms that are high frequency trading algorithms, and I'm more of a hands-on trader. And what I'm always doing is I'm focusing on the next trade. I don't think about the trade before it, and, and I'm not analyzing the risk I just took with that previous trade. It's just a fucking trade. I don't care. You know, just put it in the books. Let's get on to the next trade. And because I'm mainly a spread trader, so I'm buying here and I'm selling here, I'm trading 20 different things all the time on the bid and offer, blah, blah, blah. A lot of times I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just trying to make good trades. And then, and then the market closes and I go, I wonder what my position is. Let's sort of look at that position calculator. I look at the position and go, whoa, okay, I'll get that up on the chart. I'll get that up on the charts and see if that looks good. Oh yeah, it looks good on the charts. I like that position. I might keep that for a day or two. You know, like, <clears throat> What motivates me to make trades is, is, is when I'm looking at the markets is a lot of different things. It has to do with relative value. Uh, it, it has to do, is there a buy program in the 10 years? Is there a sell program in the 10 years? Are these spreads reaching historical levels? Are we getting near expiration now? These spreads historically have a tendency to move a certain way going to expiration. So there's a lot I'm thinking about when I'm making trades, but, but I don't dwell on what I've done. I never dwell on what I've done. Ever. When you're talking about learning how to lose, I mean, I know who's who here has been trading, let's say, less than two years. Who's been trading for more than 10? Ooh, cool. Young crowd. That's cool. <laughs> so I imagine, especially for newer traders, that's a very strange concept to put forward. Yeah. Learning how to lose. How would you actually know if you've learned how to lose? you stop doing it. <laughs> you, you, you don't lose as much and you lose less frequently. And then you say to yourself, ah, maybe I'm getting this now. Okay. Um, but you're going to lose. So I, I don't dwell. I, once again, I'm repeating myself, but I, 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 I'm so focused on the next trade. This is real Zen shit, man. This is like living in the now and spitting out what's happened in the past. If you're a Zen Buddhist, if any Zen Buddhist here, you'll make a fortune trading. So what you're trying to do here is you're trying to focus on the absolute moment of the price information that you're getting off the screen. 
And that's what you're focused on. And everything that's happened before that, you can look at it later, but if in an active market when you're trading, you want to be focused on the now of the price action that you're looking at. And if you're dwelling on other things that have happened in the past, it's going to, it's going to keep you from, from doing that. It's as simple as that. As far as losing is concerned, I mean, you know, like, when do you really actually realize that you've lost money? Well, it's when you get your statement the next day and you look at the total equity at the bottom and say, fuck, I lost money yesterday. But I, but I don't, I don't do that. I've gone months and months without looking at my statement to see if I've made or lost any money. I've gone months with that. One of the things when I first started trading, like a lot of you guys are new traders, I had to keep track of how much money I was making on a daily basis. I used to go from Chicago on the Chicago Northwestern trade up to Lake Forest every day. It's about a 45 to an hour uh, train ride, depending whether I'm taking the express train or not. And I'd sit down, I'd count every trade I made and figure out exactly how much money I made or lost on the day. I did that for a few years, right? So it's an evolutionary thing. When I first started trading, I really wanted to see how I was doing on a daily basis, right? It was important to me. Then I realized after a period of time that it wasn't so important. Then I got to a point where I said, actually, if I can com completely divorce myself from money, I'm going to be a much better trader. I know that's hard to do, but I'm telling you now, if you can, if you can get away from the money aspect of trading and just focus on the market and making good trades, you'll have, you'll be distracted by less things. There you go. I mean, I, I just, I'm at a point now and I have been for about 15, 20 years where I just don't care about the money. I, I get a monthly statement now. I'll look at a monthly chart of where my equity's been, and that's it. I don't look at daily statements. I look at nothing. I'm focused on my, on my position and the trades I want to make, the trades I'm making. What are some of the lessons? I know this is a really cliche sort of thing to say, but given someone like yourself who's been doing this for 40 years, I think it might be an interesting subject to go into. What are some of the lessons which you would like to pass on to a, a younger group of traders? Believe in yourself. Self-belief. Real big. Real, real big. Don't quit and never lose all your money. It's like a poker game. You lose all your money, you have to leave the room. Go away. Come back when you have some more money. So, yeah, and that's just very simplistic things to say, but it's, it's really true. Stay in the game and really believe in yourself. It's, it's, um, it's a real balancing act between having too big of an ego and not having enough of an ego, you know? And you gotta know yourself really well. You gotta know what your strengths are and you have to know what your weaknesses are. And it's a real game of inner exploration up here. And I find it interesting now we're all trading from screens. The screen's over there and I'm here. You wanna externalize the experience of trading? Real easy, the screen's over there and I'm here. But you shouldn't be doing that. You should be internalizing the experience of what you see on that screen into here, internalizing it. It's not you against the machine. The machine should be part of you, metaphorically. The one thing that I found and, and about trading, and it's the greatest gift that trading ever gave me, and it has nothing to do with money. It has to do with freedom up here. I knew early in my life I wasn't the type of person who, who was going to be told what to do. I realized I was going to have to find something that I could do for myself. I wasn't very good at taking orders or working for somebody. And initially, it was like, okay, to, to, to do that, I need to make some money on my own. I'll become a trader, okay? Down the track, and I made mistakes. I started, you know, when I first got some money, I started buying stupid things, buying stupid things. Then I realized that owning physical possessions was just going to be a burden to someone like myself. I'm no good. Can't look after things. I don't know how to change the oil. I can't do this. I can't do that. Owning physical possessions is a complete burden. So I stopped doing that. And then a little bit further down the track, I realized that the greatest thing that trading was going to do for me was freeing up my mind. Free me up up here. I can look at any situation in my life and treat it honestly and fairly without having to accept anybody else's dogma being shoved down my throat, and I like that. I love having freedom up here. It's a really beautiful feeling, and I wouldn't trade it for the world. And that's, that's what money's done for me. It's enhanced my, um, my existence on a lot of different levels, and it has nothing to do with fast cars, fast women, or any other nonsense. 
I was watching the golf over the weekend, and they were at the Memorial Tournament in Ohio, and Jack Nicklaus was there giving a little speech. And I wrote down what he said, and he was, because I think golf is very similar to trading. So one sport that has a, draws a lot of parallels to trading. And he said the following. He was talking about Hale Irwin, who was another golfer of his era, who was just receiving a big prize. And he referred, he said, Hale Irwin is a great manager of himself and the course. The analogy here is that a golf course is like the market. When you tee off on the first tee, what are you up against? Well, you're up against how are you going to swing the club? What, did, what, what are you thinking in your head? How am I going to play today? It's very internal. The course, how's the wind blowing? How fast are the greens? How thick is the rough? That's the marketplace. You can't, you, that's what you have to deal with. When a professional golfer tees off, he has to deal not only with himself, but the golf course. Every time you turn that machine on, you have to deal with yourself and you have to deal with the market. Very close parallels. Anyway, he said, Hale Irwin's a great manager of himself and the course. And then he just said this to anybody who wanted to hear it. He said, know who you are, know your game, play within yourself. I wrote it down because I said, fuck, this is just, this, this is trading. This is trading. You know what I mean? And he said, believe in yourself. And I've already said that to you guys. Believe in yourself. And he, another thing he said that I thought was very fascinating, he's, you know, he's talking on the TV. He said, and he's the greatest golfer ever. You know, he's won, he's dominated the sport during his era. And he said, I never thought I was the best. I never thought I was the best. He said, if I ever started thinking that way, I was absolutely destined to screw up, take a triple bogey, lose the tournament, not make the cut. So I never thought about being the best. To me, it was always the challenge to try to be the best. I thought that was interesting. I thought I'd pass that on to you guys. Next are a few snippets from the two interviews I've done with Mike Balafure. See episodes 22 and 162. Mike is the co-founder of SMB Capital, a proprietary trading firm in New York City. What were some of the hurdles you had to cross, like things that you really struggled with early on? Just edge. You know, I think that lots of times people mistake psychology with a lack of edge. And people think, oh, there's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with my mind. Um, I think a lot of times just people don't understand their edge and they don't have edge. And, you know, look, if you make a trade and there's no edge in the trade, of course you're going to get upset because you're going to probably lose money. Whereas if you're in a trade where you have edge and you make money, um, you're not going to necessarily struggle with a lots of the psychological issues because you're going to have made money. So um, I think that edge is hard. And I think people don't even understand how hard it really is. You know, great traders can barely be right more than 50% of the time and still be legendary traders. Can we just go back and pick up on, I think it was the first part of that formula you described uh, you mentioned about having a growth mindset. Can you go into that a little more? What does a growth mindset mean? What's that referring to? So there's a really great book that we recommend traders read before they actually show up uh, at our firm. And it was written by Carol Dweck, who is a, a professor. And she wrote this book uh, called Mindset. And a really, really great book. And, and the, the book essentially, the hypothesis is that um, if you come into, I'll, I'll apply it to trading, if you come into trading and you think that your talent and your talent alone is going to dictate how you do as a trader, that's called a fixed mindset. If you come into trading and think, well, how I'm doing right now is how I'm doing right now, but I can be better tomorrow. And if I do ABC, then I can be a lot better. Then that's a growth mindset. And we found at our firm that the traders who have a growth mindset become very, very successful traders. And a great example of that is at the end of the year. This year, uh, we ask our traders to come up with their yearly goals. 
And in 2016, one of our traders who I'm going to talk about their yearly goals in 2018 for, uh, this particular trader earned a green shirt. And at our firm, if you net a million dollars in trading profits for a year, you get a green shirt. It's a, it's a, it's a big honor to be able to hit this, hit this level. And in 2017, this trader earned a black shirt. And a black shirt is when a trader nets $2 million plus in trading profits for the year. And so a trader was very successful in 2016 and got even better in 2017. And when uh, he sat down to come up with his yearly goals for 2017, he said, bigger picture, I'm also thinking about making the incremental steps to be a $10 million a year trader. That's what he wants to be. And so he's not settling for being a black shirt trader. He is starting to think about the things that he needs to do and starting to do the work that he needs to do to hit that next level in his development. That's somebody who has a growth mindset. Do you find that most people in trading naturally have what you would call a, a growth mindset? No, <laughs> absolutely not. Really? Um, yeah. Um, I, I definitely think there are a, a lot of traders that, that have a growth mindset, but no, I, I don't think uh, everyone has a growth mindset. Um, I, I also think while it's preferable that people have a growth mindset, people, there are traders that are so talented that the fact that they don't have a growth mindset also doesn't stop them. Um, but it's, but it's highly preferable. Getting to a seven figure trader, how much of it is a mindset factor? I know we spoke about having a growth mindset earlier and that probably ties into this, but do you think that some people, they want to make a million dollars, like they can say that, but psychologically perhaps doubt their own ability or it seems too far beyond the realm of possibility? If that's the case, how do you overcome that? So I've written about this in the past. I, I call it small wins. And so you don't want to think about going from zero to a million dollars. You want to think about and going from zero to being able to make $1,500 in a month. I actually would take a step back. When you first start trading, a very common step is you lose too much money. And a real step in progress is to lose less. It's a real step in progress. And a real step in progress is to trade flat. And a real step in progress is to make $1,500. And so um, after you make $1,500, you set the, the next goal. Maybe I want to make $4,000 in a month and, and then maybe I want to make $10,000 in a month. And so you, you want to be thinking about what are the things you need to do to get to that next realistic step, uh, in your development. And, and it's, it, it, it is a process. We find on our desk that it takes until year three before uh, traders are going to make substantial P&L. And uh, you want to come into this game being realistic about your learning curve. You can make some money in year one and you can make good money in year two. But what we're seeing at our desk, guys have all these resources. They get to work with Dr. Steenbarger. They get and the best technology in the prop space, both on the front end side. And you know you can't use our technology unless you trade at our firm and on the automated side, and you get all the coaching and all the mentoring and plenty of capital to use um, at the firm. And it's still, and you have these experienced traders who you can learn from and watch them trade in real time, and it still takes some time to get to, to get good at it. And, um, and you get the firm backing to make sure you can support yourself uh, through those through those years, but it, but it still takes some time. So I don't think about, I don't think about trying to go from you know, the, the one yard line to across the, uh, from, from the 20 yard line to all the way across the field to the other team's goal line. I think about how do I go from the 20 to the 30? How do I get from the 30 to the 40? 
How do I get to the third? And, and just keep plugging away and catch your, put your head down and keep working. And it's easy to get from the 20 yard line to the 30 yard line. It's really almost impossible to go from the 20 yard line to, to scoring a touchdown. Um, so that's what, that's what our guys, that's what our guys are doing. And you know, that example that I used with uh, one of our top traders who wants to be a $10 million a year trader, you know, he was a seven figure trader uh, two years ago be- before that, you know, he went from a zero to a 4,000. I remember pushing him when he was about a, a eight to $10,000 a, a, a month trader, I remember pushing him and challenging him to make $30,000 in a month and uh, getting him to commit to that. And I remember him then and then doing that. Um, and then you know, he got to the point where he netted a million dollars and then he got to the point where he netted over two million and now he's pushing himself to, to make even more, but he's, he's taking those incremental steps and to, to be a $10 million a year trader, he knows he has to take these incremental steps. And so focus on those incremental steps that you need to take to get to that next level. Coming up now, a clip from episode 174 with Nishant Pobandawala. Nish is a proprietary trader at Kirshner Trading Group in Austin, Texas. Now, this clip is an awesome comeback story and it plays in perfectly with the psychological challenges associated with trading. You know, the story I was telling you that, you know, I, I should tell everyone is is the story in 2014. Um, and it was it was a great year for me to start with. I was up, I was up, you know, I, I think I was up 300,000 in the first three months. Um and it was a great, it was a great start of the year, and I was really happy. I was having my first first child, and you know, my wife was like, "Oh, we need to buy a, a, a stroller." I said, "Yeah, buy the best stroller." And I was like, <laughs> "We need to buy this and buy the best." You know, I mean, listen, it's going to be a good year. It looks great. And then um, I was playing an imbalance trade, just like I normally do, but I didn't. I for some reason I didn't get my closing print on it, so I was in ten thousand uh, Amgen AMGN. And I was short 10,000 Amgen, which I was supposed to cover at the close. And I just, something happened and I couldn't cover it. And it was Allegrin, sorry, yeah. <laughs> and I couldn't cover it. And um, and while I was trying to get out post-market, uh, um, Ackman came and said that he wants to buy the stock for 150 or $140 a share. <laughs> And, and the stock was trading that time at about 90 bucks. And so even it took me less than, I think in 30 seconds, I was down 300,000 in, in the stock. Shit. Yeah, it was just, it was crazy. I was just sitting at home and trading and basically I lost everything I made for that year. Um, and, and I mean, just the loss itself was was really hard psychologically uh i just had a child <laughs> you know it was just i think it was it was 15 days after that and i just couldn't believe what happened you know i was still in a daze i think when i came down I, I thought of quitting trading because i was like i don't know if i could ever come back from a loss that big uh or you know how long would it take you know it was just like you know my, you know my whole life was like coming in front of me and you know i was just like i don't know what to do at that moment it was it was it was tough time i was pretty much in tears i called my my old coach and uh, he kind of told me he's like no just stick in there just don't worry about it just you know uh just hang in there and you know i was like okay fine you know what this is the reason i started trading is because i love trading and it's for the passion of trading because this is what i would do every day of my life if i had a chance if i would i would work on weekends if there was a, if there was a short of trading on weekends so i said you know what let's just go back to the love of trading and you know forget everything else and i started uh, you know trying to make a small comeback i think i remember the, the, the next month i lost $15000 because i was just not there mentally then slowly i think i started making I think you know, I think made like you know five thousand dollars and ten thousand dollars and seven thousand ten thousand, kind of slowly 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 started chipping in on that loss, and then uh, I think in in about three or four months I, 
I found out my father had cancer, uh, so I had to go back to India. So I went three or four times to India, and I was like, dude, what else can you know the world throw at me now? You know, it's like this loss. I just had a, a child, my first child. My father had cancer, uh, so he passed away in December. And by that time, I'd you know I was I was I was still flying in and out of you know Austin to to Bombay. Uh, so I didn't have enough time to even trade properly. You know, I was still, I was still, you know, so much happening at that moment. So I kind of, you know, I think by the end of the year, I think this, this loss happened you know, in April and by December, I think I had, I had, I had covered about half my loss. I was down still 150 for the year. Didn't make a paycheck, nothing. And then comes 2015. So, uh, I think it was 24th or 21st or 21st of August. So yeah, 21st of August is 21st of August is when I, I, I finished my loss of 150,000. So that's when I covered all my losses. And then 24th is when the flash crash happened. All right. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> so you can imagine the emotions that I was going through at that moment in life because I had this crazy loss. It took me about a year and a half to recover. And I just recovered about three days before the biggest day in my life. That's crazy, man. There's like a, yeah. there's something, there's something to that story. Like, you know, you were, you were very close to giving up, but you know, 12 months yeah. later, yeah, this massive win on the flash crash, which is like, just makes your whole career pretty much. <laughs> yeah. I mean, then you're like, okay, at least, you know, now you have enough money to, you know, to survive in trading because, you know, I mean, if you don't have money in the bank, it's just so hard to trade the way you want to trade, you know? So I always tell people like, listen, you know, get a second job, do whatever you want, but keep some money in, in the bank so that you have that confidence. You're psychologically, you're, you know, strong, and you don't rely only on trading income, you know, because for a while it's it's so hard. Trading is such a hard thing because psychologically, mentally, uh, everything, you know, it can screw you up pretty badly, you know. <laughs> and for me, it was like, that was it. I mean, for me, it was like that whole 15, 16 months ordeal ended up with the high of my life, you know. So, um you learn a lot from all that because I'm like, you know, I mean, I was pretty much in tears after that, after that big, uh, big day in 2015, I called my wife and I'm just like, you know, what a circle this has been and what it's taught me, you know? And, you know, I mean, I had some big days before that. I remember like my big, my first big day, I think it was in, I think 2000 and, uh, seven, I think 2007 it was a big day because I made like, I think I made a hundred thousand dollars in, in one day. And I told all my friends, guys, we're going to party tonight. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, listen, I was like 20, 24, 25. I was like, dude, this is like, dude, who makes a hundred K in a day? This is like yes. epic, you second know, year and you trading. Have, second year into trading, forget second year. I never seen that kind of money in my life. So I'm like, listen, party guys, let's go out and uh, let's drink. So I, Got everyone to a restaurant, uh, just order champagne, this, you know, whatever people want to order. I said, order guys. And we all, we're all drunk and this and that. I think I spent like, a, like I think $1,200 that night just, you know, buying drinks for all my friends. And then, you know, uh, my biggest loss is obviously in 2015, uh, 2014 when I lost 300000 And I'm just like, you know, obviously your friends are there for you, but, you know, no one is giving you the $1,000 back when you want it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, yeah, it doesn't I, work you that kind of, <laughs> Yeah, so can you kind of learn in life that, listen, let's not celebrate the lows. I mean, let's not celebrate the highs and let's not, you know, frown about the lows. You know, everything will come when the time is correct, just work hard and, you know, have the passion for trading, which I think is the number one thing for a trader. Uh, if you have the passion, you'll do well, the money will come automatically. And I've always believed in that. So, so when I had this big day also, I didn't celebrate. I just went home and I said, Sana, you know, to my wife, I said, let's have a drink and that's it. I'll now play a part from episode 169 featuring Jack Ma. Jack is a proprietary futures trader and head of Mentor Capital. While he trades government bonds around contract expiry time, he mostly trades Australian bank bills, working structures across the yield curve. Earlier I was talking about psychology in terms of, you know, believing in um, 
sort of the uncertainty, right? That anything can happen. You kind of got to believe that now, because if you do believe it, then you're not going to be stubborn when you have to be like, okay, fine. That was a, it was a 95, 5% trade. The 5% happened. Fuck it. It happened. All right. And then you can, you are at peace with it. Now, I would say the next step is, you know, you should reward yourself in a way that's consistent in, in how, how you sort of want to, how, where you want your psychology to be, right? For example, you don't want to be just jumping for joy when you make money and going to a deep depression in the corner when you lose money, right? Because if you're rewarding yourself based on the money, amount of money you've made, it's actually better to reward yourself based on the quality of the trade. Um, cause that will make your actions and your psychology consistent with where you're trying to be, right? You don't want to be the guy who just celebrates making money. You, you want to celebrate making good trade. If that means losing less money, you need to celebrate it. You know, whereas if you make money on a shit trade, that's, that's where, that's where it's really dangerous. So how do you, how do you differentiate between the two? Because that can be, that can be quite difficult. Um, I've got a good one. Um, it, it's been so long that I don't think the firm will care anymore, but I never told anyone this earlier, right? So, for example, we we trade tier one Australian domestic data, right? We try to jump right on that for a second. So, when I first started, and I'm talking about five months in, all right, there was one time where we were all waiting for the unemployment figure, the largest figure in Australia, right? Now, you don't want to go into that with an outright. It's crazy. It's And back then, it would gap 10 points each way, and that's huge seeing that most trades you're trying to make one or two. Um, I apparently, I I jumped in, right? Well, when I thought the data was out. Oh, okay. <laughs> so the, the market gapped three prices down, right? And I was like, oh, it's out. It's, we're going so down. So you were already in. Well, no, I wasn't in yet, right? So I'm waiting for the figure to come out. Okay. And then the market, this is all within like seconds, yeah. obviously, right? The market moved, gapped three prices down. I go, yep, it's out. So I went and sold. And then it paused for what seemed like an eternity. It was only probably another second because it was a bit weird. I was like, why is it paused? And then it collapsed like there's no tomorrow, right? Um, it collapsed so much I didn't even know what price I got in. I had to go check because my DOM was refreshing so fast I couldn't even see the price. Now, I was lucky because I was right. So I made 10 ticks in an instant trade, right? Like it was probably a second. What actually happened is I uh, I, bet, I placed a uh, ten grand fifty fifty bet. <laughs> right, <laughs> that's a shit trade that I made money on. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. So so so, so obviously there are, there's very clear ones, and I thought I should ask sorry because it's funny. I mean they'll hear about it now yeah. in the firm, but <laughs> if that went the other way, I might not be here talking to you anymore. Yeah, to, to be really honest, man, that's crazy. You, yeah, you're very lucky that went in your favor. Oh, absolutely. Uh, to this day, I recognize that. Like, uh, there's two things in my career could have ended my career. I'm just. So it takes a little luck to get to not get completely crushed. But that being said, I've also had a lot of bad luck. I just don't remember those because these are the better stories. You know? Yeah, like, but that's it as well. Yeah. Like you do also have a lot of bad luck as a trader, or it seems like you have a lot of bad luck. That when mm. you do have some good luck, it's worth um, enjoying it. <laughs> yeah, no, why not? You know, I, I couldn't tell anyone that story because I figured they might uh, look unfavorably. But now I'm pretty sure it's fine now. Well, let's hope so. Because uh, a lot of people are soon to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> and what about in examples where it's it's not so obvious, just on like mm. sort of day to day trading? Yeah, I, I would say that the probably rule number one, and I'm obviously I'm assumed the people who's going to take advice from this are relatively new to trading, right? Is following not following your plan, right? Because in the beginning, I would I would hope that is gospel. You know, if you have a plan, you know where are you entering or what needs to happen for you to enter a trade and then you know where are you taking profit where are you taking the puke um and and why and what for whatever anything needs to happen right all of these should should have been planned out before you enter a trade now if you enter the trade and you don't follow that plan that's a shit trade it doesn't matter how much money you've just made right um now the reason i say that is because in the beginning it's more often than not that mid trade decisions are usually not good ones, right? Whether you're under the pump, right? And you know, a typical example would be you you'd you get into what would seem like a short term trade, and it's starting to come close to your stop. You know, yeah, but on a bigger time frame, this looks all right. 
So this now is turning into a long-term trade. Now, no one turn, changes a short-term trade into a long-term trade when they're winning, right? They, they will get to your take profit, you're like, great, happy days, I made money, to trade work out. You only do that when it's completely going against you. So that's a really good example. Like you don't, re in the beginning, you don't really want to be changing your plan. Now, if your plan is crap and that's fine, you know, then you still need to follow that through because discipline is really important as well. Having that discipline to follow your plan. Then when a trade's over, you're not in the heat of the moment anymore. You can objectively assess your plan. Maybe it was flawed, but that's fine. This is why you're here, you're learning. You know, it's not about making money in the beginning anyway. Yeah. And as we're kind of on the, the topic of psychology here, I did want to ask you, how do you deal with uh, periods where you're perhaps underperforming and not doing as well as you'd expect to be doing? Um, from a PNL point of view or from a, from a, yeah, I, I guess we could yeah. sort of talk about both, but yeah, mostly from a, a PNL point of view, like let's say you're just on a bad run and yeah. uh, I mean, I don't know, um, you know, what your bad runs in the past have looked like, but let's just say, you know, there's, been two months go by and you've mm. you know you're not really up <laughs> yeah oh no that's yeah um i think uh, I, I think um and i read this in in one of these books i can't remember what it was it it says success is perishable mastery is not might have been like a book called the trading athlete or something um, I, f I find it really important, right? Because you, you know, we, we value ourselves and, and this could even go to day-to-day -day life, right? On something, you pride yourself in something, right? Um, you know, whether it's your job, your money, whatever, your looks, <laughs> could be anything, right? How well you dance. Now, <laughs> <laughs> now, if you, if you, you know, if you value yourself based on something that's perishable, because you think it's not, but you know, it can, like any physical thing is perishable, whether it's, yeah, it's a, if it, it's your house, it's your money, it's, it's to, to be honest, you know, your girlfriend or something, right? Then when that perishes, you're going to, you're going to be in a deep state of distress or, or whatever it is, right? So I guess I've always looked at myself and pr pr prided, uh, sorry, proud, what's, how do you say? Yeah, yeah. What's the right word there? I don't know, right? I'll try to say pride myself in it. Yeah, uh, yeah it sounds weird, myself. is it? I think that's yeah. the right way. So let's pride myself, <laughs> well, yeah, let's go with it. Pride myself in my abilities, right? And both the ability to climb out of holes, like, you know, p &R holes, as well as that, well, okay, I've had two, you know, some bad runs. If I, if I look at it and go, was it really, am I really doing the wrong thing? And that's why I asked you to clarify, you know, that question. Now, if I'm doing the right things by my edge and I've assessed that there's nothing wrong with my trades, it's just that I've taken on, you know, two months of 80, 20 trades and they've given me two months of 20% outcomes, then that actually doesn't really affect me as much. You know, I, I, I get really annoyed myself when I, you know, do the wrong things, the wrong trades. So, so therefore I'm like, okay, I've lost some money or whatnot, but I'm still the same trader, you know, therefore I can still hold sort of my head up high and go into it again and just go, that was the 20%. Whereas if I, you know, if I was pride myself in my account, then maybe not so much after that too. So I think that's, that's how I deal with it from a psychology point of view. I just, I really focus on sort of what I can control, which is my skill and how I trade, not the market. Next up, a short clip from my interview with Tom Sosnoff, which was episode 87. Tom is a former trader. He's also the guy who co-founded Think or Swim and then sold it to TD Ameritrade before going on to launch the Tasty Trade Network. Pretty much I'm just throwing this clip in the mix because it's an opposing view and Tom's reaction when asked about psychology is kind of hilarious. One of the things that a lot of traders are, are very much into, and some even say that it's, you know, maybe 90% of the challenge is trading psychology. Uh, I understand you feel very differently about this. Can you give us trading your take? Trading psychology is 100% bullshit. It's people like to, we, we're enablers. Our society is, is you know, we, we've created a society of enablers. And so we make people feel, feel good about their inept financial abilities, their lack of know-how, it's, it's not because they don't have the right, you know, um, trader psychology or, or they're not seeing the right trader psychologist. It's because, and most of the people that are trader psychologists that I've ever run across have, have, would have zero value in my world. This is not a, you know, right brain, left brain type thing. 
the, the reason people aren't successful is because they don't take the time and the commitment to be successful. That's all it is. And I'm tired of enabling people and, and making trying to make everybody feel good when the industry is conflicted by, by, the, by the true sense. This industry makes money by managing other people's money and by selling people money and by selling fear. And the only way to get around that and to change that culture is to develop the know-how yourself. And 99% of the people are unwilling to develop that know-how. So the idea that there is some trader psychology out there, it's complete bullshit. But I mean, even operating like a mechanical strategy or being very quantitative in your approach, uh, do you think that there is a certain degree of psychology, even though it's not nowhere near 90%, um, do you think that there's a small part of it that, that does come down to your psychology? No, I think it's mechanics. It's like anything else. It's almost like breathing. I think there's a, I mean, listen, if you're talking about ego, that's fine because, you know, everybody has egos. If you're talking about, you know, risk taking and things, I don't consider that part of your quote psychology. I consider that all part of your mechanics. Now, if you want to, if you want to consider psychology mechanics, then, then sure, but I don't. And, and I think this is a, this is a, um, this is a game that, you know, that comes down to, comes down to mechanics. You said before you didn't play blackjack. I don't believe blackjack is a game that has, there's, there's a psychological element to blackjack. Just like, I don't even believe there's a psychological element to, um, you know, to, to any card game, even poker or, you know, or craps or anything else. I mean, I know people argue that there is in poker, but if you've ever watched poker players, most of them play by the book. And, and when you're playing any other kind of game, it is straight by the book. So, and now we're starting to see even sports has become, you know, a game of mechanics. We used to say, oh, this, this head coach or this manager is a genius because he made, he pulled the right string or made the right move at this time. And the reality right now is everything is becoming part of saber metrics and statistics. And, and of course it's going to go that way because 90, 95% of the time that's going to win every time. So no, I'm, I'm poo-pooing the whole psychology aspect to it. And I'm suggesting that it's a lack of know-how. It's a lack of desire. And until we get people willing to take on that intellectual challenge, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll give ourselves a crutch and call it psychology. To take us out here in concluding the best of trading psychology part one is Dan Shapiro. And this segment comes from episode 32. Having come up as a prop trader in New York City, Dan now trades independently and with a focus on high beta names. He's also encountered a fair share of setbacks during his career, so you can really appreciate the rawness when he speaks on psychology matters. We've talked about how you lost money you know, throughout that two-year period um, in, in quite depth, so Let's talk about how you go through losing periods these days. Sure, they're not quite as, as dramatic as two years at a time, but you know you still go through losing periods. I mean, everyone does. So how do you stay in, I don't know, good spirits? How do, you, how do you keep your head up through losing periods and how do you break out of that? Yeah, that's a great that's a great question, Aaron. As we previously discussed, I, I get tons of emails all the time and they're never... They're never asking me, well, what do you think about this chart? You know, again, what do I think about a chart is irrelevant. Um, the question always is, how do you make it through, man? How do, you, how do you do it? How do you mentally stay afloat? And, you know, there, there's, a, there's a great answer to that. Number one, and here's my advice. Number one, guys, turn off your P&L. Turn it off. Um, you know, turn it off. I, I, you know, I completely, I don't even know where my P&L box is on my platform. Turn it off. And the reason why uh, you have to turn off your PL is number one, this whole business is all or all, all uh, emotion versus reality, right? The more you're emotionally committed to a trade, the more chances than not you're going to completely mistrade it, and everything you're going to do in this trade is wrong, and then everything is going is to happen after the, the trade is over is probably going to make you angrier and angrier because eventually the trade will probably work out your way. Okay. So the first thing to do is turn off your PL. Okay. Uh, number one, and here's kind of relevant advice here. Also, you want to turn off your PL because if you're having a good day, and I hear this all the time, Dan, I have a $30,000 account. 
okay, what should be my goal for the day? And my answer to that is your goal for the day is to make it to the next day, okay, which has nothing to do with your PL. And what happens is when you're trading, you're trading well, okay, if you look at your PL and you say to yourself, well, my goal is a thousand bucks for the day, okay, and you hit your goal within the first hour or so. And then I know a lot of traders, they'll shut off, they'll shut off their day for the, they'll shut off their day, right? They'll completely shut off the day and they'll leave. Here's the problem. The day that you can make their 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 5 grand, whatever it is, whatever interval you trade, whatever tier size you trade, the day you can make that money really, really quickly, you don't realize it, but you're playing a premium hand. You're playing the kings. You're playing the jacks. You're playing the aces. You're playing the queens. Okay, So that day is turning out to be a premium hand. And what you're doing is you're taking a pair of aces and you're putting in a bet of 50 bucks. That's basically what you're doing. And you're telling the guy on the other, that's playing against you, I'm all in for 50 bucks. And once you hit that pot, you say to yourself, okay, I'm done for the day. So you're losing out on a premium hand. Every, every professional trader will tell you, what we're looking for is premium. We're looking for those pocket aces, okay? So the day that you can make two, three, four, five grand for the first 30 minutes, 45 minutes, you're in a very, very bullish scenario, playing a premium hand. So the last thing you wanna do is say to yourself, well, I'm up a grand for the day, I'm done. And you don't realize you, that one grand could turn into 3,000, could turn into 6,000, could turn into 10,000 because you're riding that euphoric, euphoric hand. You're riding those pocket aces. And I don't care how, you know, how misguided you are, everybody eventually plays pocket aces. And the most important part is if you remove the p l box, those pocket aces really turn out to something. Um, on the way down, it's even more important to turn off your p l I already know on my tier size, let's, you know, on my tier size, and let's just use any, any, let's just use a thousand share lots. Just make it easier. I already understand if I'm putting on a trade and the stock goes a dollar against me, I know, I know mentally, I mean, I know I can do the math, you know, put on a thousand shares, down, you know, down a point, you're down a grand. Okay. But mentally, if you see it visually, if you see it, that thousand turns into a hundred, might as well turn into a hundred thousand because your next trade you don't want to get down 1,200. You don't want to get down 1,500. So what you're going to do is you're going to, you're going to trade the PL and not trade the setup. Okay. So you could be looking at a five star setup. A stock comes out of a two month range, comes out, you know, takes 20, 30 cents spike, comes back into your, you know, turn, comes back into your entry, goes down 10, 15 cents. You're already down a grand. You're mentally already distraught. You sell the position at a 10, 15 cent loss. Next thing you know, 35 seconds later, the stock's at the highs of the day. So you're mentally already destroyed. You're done. You're done. Once you're once you're trading your PL instead of the setup, you might as well, you might as well, you know, wrap it up for the day because nothing good is ever going to happen when you're trading the PL. And the more deeper and deeper you get into the day, the more erratic mistakes you're doing, the more eager you are. The more you're, if you're a man, the more testosterone levels are rising. Okay. And all you're doing is committing further and further into emotionally protecting your PL and not trading, uh, trading the setup the proper way. So that's my kind of my first tip. Everybody goes through slumps. Okay. Everybody goes through slumps. I've had, I had a week, um, two months ago. Okay. Two months ago, I went from having one of my top three biggest weeks the prior, prior, you know, prior week to just not getting anything going. I mean, I went through Monday through Thursday, I couldn't make a dime. I wasn't really losing any money, I just couldn't make a dime. Like everything was wrong, right? Everything was wrong. Stocks were um, snapping back out of breaking down out of bottom channels on shorts. Stocks were getting rejected on longs. There was reload sellers on my longs. There were re reload buyers on my shorts. Just nothing went right, you know, nothing went right. And I sat there, you know, I sat there a couple of days and I just started laughing. I, there's no, eventually you start laughing. You, you can't, you know, you can't take this business, um, you can't take this business to heart, okay? You can't think that, that, that this is, this is, you know, every bad thing is pointed at, at you, okay? You'll go through these horrific times that you can't get anything going. You'll go through these horrific times, like perfect example. I, I last year, about, about a year ago, uh, I don't know if you, any of your listeners remember, there was, a huge run into the close on close on these ag stocks, these uh, potash and intrepid potash and all these stupid things. And I took um, intrepid potash overnight 
And the whole group was like down 25% the next day. The next day. I mean, it was just, I was like, what? Wait, wait a minute. You're telling me there's no specific company news and I'm down four bucks on this trade, which is insane. And mentally, I was like, well, I could try to make this money back today. Okay. Let me see what the market gives me today. Okay. Let me see. Because I, I've learned long enough the revenge trade does not work. Okay. Anytime you have any type of raw emotion going into a trade, you're going to mess it up. Okay. So what I learned a long time ago is there's not one event, bad event in your trading career that should be able to take you out of your game. Okay. Uh, things happen all the time. Stocks get downgraded, uh, bad, you know, FDA news. You know, I try not to trade a lot of biotech, especially overnight, um, cause they blow up all the time. Um, but the most important part of everything is I understand the highs and lows of this business because of what I went through after, after nine 11. So for me, when I go on a really big hot streak, I am not impressed because I expect to make money. Obviously, uh, every trade that I put on, I feel like I'm going to make money. I feel there's certain days, um, I can walk on water and then there's days I can't get anything going. You know what I mean? And those days you just say to yourself, you know what? It just wasn't meant to be. You don't need to keep on piling on positions. I could feel, I could figure out within the first 30 minutes if I'm going to have value in the day. Uh, so if I'm wrong in the first couple of trades, what's the point of me keep on piling it on, right? Because it escalates. It escalates very, very quickly. You could go from being down three grand to be down eight grand. Eight grand turns into 14. 14 turns into 21. What's the point? Cut yourself off. Understand there's, you know, you're not getting a premium hand. Okay. Uh, emotionally, there's nothing you can do. You can't cry your money back to you. Okay. Um, so, you know, but the most important part when you go through a slump, okay, just realize that, you know, sometimes the easiest thing to do is just take a step back. Okay. Take a step back. Just watch the market, watch the, watch the order flow. Sometimes order flow won't translate into what's going on on the surface. It just won't because order flow most of the time will not be organic. Okay. And that's where social media that a lot of these people, you know, tout and hype these stocks for everybody to jump in, you know, all that stuff. Uh, so you got to just take a step back and just say, Hey, look, you know, it's just not my day. Maybe it's not my two days, but you know what? I know what I, I know what I need. I know what I want. And until I get those premium hands, there's no point to do it. Um, the problem a lot of traders have is just, they can't accept defeat. Okay. And there's a bigger, you know, there's a big, there's a big picture there. Okay. And you go back into the theory of war, right? There's plenty of battles that are lost, right? Plenty of battles. Battles are lost all the time. The most important thing is to win the war. So I could lose a battle, right? I could fight with Tesla and, you know, there's a reload seller sitting there at the top of the range and it just, the guy won't let go. The guy won't let go. And you know what? I'll figure that part out. You know, once it breaks the range, I'll get out. I'll take my loss, but I'm not going to lose the war on one trade. And I see it all the time that many traders are so fixated about being right instead of fixated about trading properly. And that snowballs into day after day after day until they realize, you know what, this is just not for me. And the saddest part about the whole trading cycle is people will, most people will never uh, trade up to their potential, okay? Because they won't give themselves a chance to playing those premium hands. And they take everything to heart and they believe that everything they do is the result of bad things, just everything bad. You know, some, somebody just has this evil eye on you. And the reality is, you know what? The market most of the times won't get you, won't give you what you want. Uh, most of the times it won't celebrate your existence. All the market wants to do is take your money and take your confidence. Because remember, I could go on, and this is, this is a very important point. I could go on a run three weeks in a row, right? Three weeks in a row, have a magnificent run. And this is how fragile us, us traders are. You can go two days without making money and you've completely lost your confidence. Think about that. Think about how many times tra traders have done that. You could go on a three week run doing the same thing every day, every day, every day, every day. You lose money two days in a row. You start questioning everything you did for your whole career. Okay. And I say this all the time. You don't lose your confidence. It gets transferred to another trader. Okay. It gets transferred to another trader. Okay. 
because you can't lose something that is obviously shown you promise or prosperity in the past. You're just a product of what's happening in the moment. And just sometimes we can't control what we see in the markets. So instead of snowballing it, letting it go out two, three, five days, take a step back, you know, do something nice for yourself. Okay. Get a massage. Okay. Go to the beach, go to the pool, go to the sauna, do something nice for yourself. Okay. Um, and when you clear your head, you come back, just watch the order flow. Is it telling you the same thing that it told you two weeks ago? Is it telling you the same thing, hell, that it told you two days ago? What's different about this tape today that was indifferent from a week ago? Okay. And little by little, when you take the step back, you finally kind of see it in a weird way. You kind of see it. And once you see it, you can start making adjustments. And remember, at the end of the day, everything we do is all adjustments. It's one big adjustment. You've reached the end of this episode of Chat with Traders. But rest assured, there are more episodes loaded with real market insight and zero hype on the way soon. So to stay updated with each great new release, subscribe to the podcast and iTunes. And we'd love it if you'd leave a rating and review. We'll catch you next time on Chat with Traders.